So we're here to talk today about the dark forest. I'm Arthur Doler, like Ken said, or Art, whichever. I'm a software engineer. Um, I'm not a therapist, I'm not a psychologist, but I love brains, as I'm sure anybody who's been unfortunate enough to have a conversation with me over the course of this conference has discovered. Any conversation with me turns into a talking about brains within about 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, they're fascinating machines. And I love especially taking things that we have learned about psychology and about neurology and transforming those and translating those into things we can actually do at our jobs. My job is here at Aperture. Um, we're in, located in Omaha. We're a software consultancy. We've got a booth out there. You should come play the game. It is stupidly hard. I'm only sort of sorry, but it's also really fun. So with that aside, it's, uh, it's been a hell of a couple of years, hasn't it? We had 2020, then we had 2021. I thought it was going to be okay. And then 2022 came along, basically told 2021 to hold its beer and proceeded to just make things infinitely worse. We've had to deal with wildfires, hurricanes, natural disasters around the entire globe, unrest here and across the entire planet, whether it's civil or otherwise. And oh yeah, that whole global pandemic thing that is literally still going on. Multiple years of a novel coronavirus rampaging around the globe. We've had supply chain disruptions. <laughs> We've been working from home a whole bunch or trying to with our family there. We've had endless Zoom calls with our families there. <laughs> We've been ordering takeout, trying to work out, and binge watching all of our favorite shows while all of the rest of our family is there. But our pets loved it anyway, it was great. Or if you don't have a family or you lived alone, your existence turned into basically this. I remember there was a tweet from sometime mid pandemic. I unfortunately don't remember the author, but they were saying like, I wake up and I look at the small screen until it's time to look at the medium screen. And I look at the medium screen for a while until I finally let myself go watch the big screen. And then when that's done, I go back to the small screen before I go to sleep. This endless cycle of just being attached to a digital existence while your entire world has shrunk to the span of like, a radius of like 25 feet. We've had to be deal with, we felt uncertainty and confusion. We felt frustration and anger. We felt fear. We felt sadness. All of these things in amounts that are way larger than we normally experience. We've reconsidered where we work. We've reconsidered how we work. We've reconsidered where we live. We've even reconsidered why we work and the very reason that we go to work in the first place. All of that, again, in the span of a couple years. Over the course of this talk today, we're going to talk about your brain and you, and we're going to use a metaphor to help you understand some of what's going on in your brain. The metaphor is called the walled garden and the dark forest. Then we're going to talk about what your brain did during the pandemic in the light of that metaphor. And then we're going to talk about how you survive fires like that global pandemic and how you prepare yourself for the next one that inevitably is coming along. We've had a tremendous number of thoughts and emotions happening. All of these things building up over time in that relatively short period of time. Now, psychology has a word for this. They call it stress which is just so overwhelmingly generic that it's hysterical. If stress gets bad enough, they call it trauma. But trauma is actually a kind of problematic word these days. We've taken it and pulled it into the popular zeitgeist, and we're using it in ways that aren't necessarily specifically definite, defined and don't necessarily match the clinical definitions. I much prefer the metaphor of thinking about trauma as brain indigestion. There's a therapist named Britt Frank who has a book out called uh, The Science of Stuck. And she says that brain indigestion is anything that happens too much, too fast, or too soon for your nervous system and for your brain to handle. That's the origin of this brain indigestion stuff. And I love this metaphor because it really goes pretty far. You can get indigestion in a whole bunch of different ways. It can happen because you have one really big bad thing or a whole bunch of small bad things, or it can even happen because you have something bad that's on top of something that's actually okay and would be fine in a normal context. 
Just a little bit more on top of it makes it not okay. And even better, it shows that it's relative. Something that totally wrecks you can be perfectly fine for someone else. It just matters what your demographics are, what your lived experience in the world is, who you are as a person. Those are the things that define how much you're going to be able to handle and whether some, you're going to be able to handle something that someone else couldn't. On top of that, when you get indigestion, you don't generally feel like you failed. I mean, you may feel like you've made a really bad decision, but you don't feel like you're a broken person because you got indigestion. And you shouldn't feel that way because you're experiencing things that we've been having. And you don't feel broken when somebody else gets indigestion and you don't. In fact, you probably feel a little bit of schadenfreude, right? So what does any of that have to do with work, right? This is a conference nominally about work and about coding and about software. So why am I up here talking about brains for 40 minutes? We have this tendency to believe that we can leave all of the things we've experienced over the last couple years or any really stressful or anxious experience at the door of work. And I'm here to tell you that that's not true. We really want to believe it is. And I, trust me, more than anyone else, I wish it were true. It would make my job an infinitely large amount of easier. But it's not. It's not true. We tend to think that our brains are the be-all, end-all of existence. We tend to think that the brain is just the number one champion organ in your body and it can do anything and it's great. That it's this infinitely expanding muscle that all we have to do is think a little harder and try a little better and maybe do some extra things and we can just accomplish anything and survive anything and that's absolutely not the case. This is called the neurocentric bias and it's really only arisen as we've started to dig into how fascinating and complex and to be fair Wonderful, the brain, the piece of wet meat that's sitting between your ears actually is. But it has its limits. How many people used an alarm clock to get up today? Yeah. You're all acknowledging your brain has limits. You cannot magically wake yourself up at a certain point in time. Again, it would be really nice. But it's not true. Your brain is limited. And the systems that it is connected to physically in your body are also limited. But your brain is part of a bunch of larger systems too, not just ones that it physically connects to in its body, although that's true, but external systems, things like your alarm clock, things like your to-do lists, things like your family or your partner who reminds you of things, sometimes a little much, but usually I'm needed. So these are the things that we use to help us extend our mind. And we do this naturally but we don't think about it too much. This whole idea is called the extended mind. And if you go a little further down the road, they call it extended cognition. And it's actually, they talk about how these things fold into your very thought, that your entire experience of cognition in the world involves and includes all of these external tools, which explains how all of us feel about Stack Overflow. <laughs> that it's just kind of this other part of us. It's like, oh yeah, that's where my memory is. It's over here. And while your brain is not a computer, it does have a kind of finite throughput capacity. This is generally called working memory. A lot of you have probably heard of the memory trope about your short-term memory, where it's like seven plus or minus things that you can remember at any one, plus or minus two things at any one point in time. Your working memory is kind of similar in that there's literally a limited number of spots of things that you can actively juggle at one point in time. And when those things start to get overwhelmed, clogged up, it actually disrupts your ability to navigate through the world. And you might not even notice this is happening. You just actually think you're failing. Why does this happen? Why do we have to go through all of this? Well, let's get to that metaphor. Let's start talking about the walled garden in the dark forest. I want you to imagine the conscious part of your brain, the part of the brain that you tend to think of as you. As a resident of this garden, this glorious, small, beautiful garden with really tall, really thick walls. And the garden is wonderful. You can do a lot of things in the garden. But it's actually kind of small. Conscious intentional thought is actually a fairly small portion of what your brain does. This is called the intentional self by Gleb Sapersky, and it's a metaphor that I love. This is the self that has intention. Outside of the walls of this garden, 
is the dark forest. And the dark forest is everything else your brain does. All of the other processes and procedures and things that we've evolved over a period of time to do things to save us, to protect us, this is all of the other pieces of your brain. And this is the autonomous self, the self that operates on its own without us tracking it, without us telling it what to do, the thing that keeps you breathing. But the intentional self inside of the walled garden, it can't see outside. It cannot get outside the garden. The best it can do is kind of chuck messages over the wall and something out there in the dark forest chucks messages back. But you don't know what. And you don't know why it, got the, it gave you the answer that it did. What you can start to pull from this metaphor is that the vast bulk of what your brain does is not under your conscious control. You're not largely in the driver's seat for a lot of it. You, the intentional self, are actually largely ignorant of the bulk of what happens in your brain. The neural pathways for you to inspect it just actually aren't there. The fact that we think we can do this is actually called the introspection illusion. Because you really feel like you can do this. I guarantee almost anyone who hasn't heard of this before is sitting there going, but I can do that. That's the thing I can do. You can't. I can't either. Just learning about it doesn't even help you. The introspection illusion, I struggled with how to portray this, and I ended up coming up with this. When you get messages that come from the dark forest, you have a chance to examine those, to say, okay, I'm going to look at this. Do I believe this thought? Do I feel this feeling? Are these things that I want to believe? Are avocados overrated? Now, you can spend that time to cognitively think through, to use that intentional self to process. Are all of these things true? Which one's better? Is it actually better? Is it actually overrated? I don't know. But this takes energy. This takes sugar, which is what your brain runs on. Your cognitive intentional self takes way more sugar than the autonomous self, and your brain doesn't like to use it. It also causes this uncomfortable state called cognitive dissonance, where you're trying to hold two conflicting thoughts in your head at the same time, and your brain's just really not good at it, and you don't like it. You don't have an explanation for how your brain arrived at that avocado's message. You can try to come up with one. But most of the time, what we're going to do is just accept, this is a thing I believe. This is a true fact from my head. Done. You start from that assumption. And then what you do is work with your autonomous self to actually come up with an explanation. This is called confabulation. So for example, for avocados, you could say, well, I don't like avocados because they're kind of slimy, and every time I eat them, I get a little bit nauseated. It's just not good for me. But what could be going on behind the scenes is actually the first time you had avocados, it was at Disney World when you were five years old, and you got heat stroke because it was 101 degrees in the shade. You ended up puking avocado out through your nose, and that's why you don't like avocados. <laughs> You've forgotten the memory. Your parents have definitely not, but you've forgotten the memory. <laughs> but it's still available. That information is still available to your somatic system, the system that controls kind of your gut, etc. And that's why you actually don't like them. You feel nauseated every time, and you think it's just because they're slimy and gross and weird. But it's not. This is called confabulation. And confabulation is the process of coming up with a story that makes narrative sense even when you don't have access to the real story, because your brain never wants to tell you it doesn't know the answer. If you ask your story, brain why something is that true, why you believe something, it will never come back and be just like, I don't know, man. <laughs> always, it always has an answer. And the reason this is happens is because, in part, the intentional system, the intentional self, is really just an exception handler for the autonomous self. The part of you that you think of as you is really just there because your autonomous self needs something that can think hard when something unexpected comes along. Think about driving to work. How many people have driven to work and you get there and you have no memory of the drive? Yeah, look around. That's a lot of people. That should be really scary. <laughs> but we don't die in car crashes every day. We don't all just instantly get into our cars and drive into trees because our autonomous system is actually handling this for us. It's just like, yeah, I got this. Go think your big thoughts. So we spend time thinking about, this is what I'm going to do at work, or I got to go to the store because I'm going to go get tacos, and it's going to be great. Yes, taco night. 
But, I mean, that's literally what we think about when we're driving. I listen to podcasts all the time. I'm in my head listening to the podcast. I'm not paying attention to anything. But you bet your ass, if an elephant shows up on the road, <laughs> your autonomous system is just like, oh, excuse me. We have, we have a problem here, and I need some assistance. Because it doesn't know how to handle this. You've never encountered this before. I mean, unless you have spent time in India or somewhere there are actual elephants that might be on a road. And when we're on autopilot, when we're bound up in the thoughts that our conscious self is thinking, that our intentional self is thinking, when we get tired, when we get hungry, when we get emotional, we are way more likely to fall into that confabulation trap, to let the autonomous self ride and just believe whatever's coming out of it and not spend the time and energy to examine those thoughts. And that can get dangerous because that dark forest is full of processes. It's not just one thing. It's a bunch of them that have evolved over time up in our brain, back through all of our evolutionary history. And they tell us things like, you should totally eat that last break room donut. Or just skip the meeting, go take a nap, it'll be great. Or yeah, you should totally stay up until two in the morning playing that new video game. Or just one more drink. Right? These are the things that your brain kind of tells you, and you have to consciously override them. But your brain is telling you these things because we, it evolved in an environment where you couldn't just go out in the, into the freaking hallway and get a Mountain Dew. You couldn't go out and get like, what, seven or eight donuts? How many did they let you take? Has anyone tested? <laughs> you could just take as many donuts as you want. They're all free. You, we didn't evolve like that, right? Sugar wasn't an available thing. Our brain is not set up for that. You are a howling parliament of voices that is constantly vying for your conscious self's attention. Constantly trying to get you to do things, to behave in certain ways, to believe in certain things. But these aren't really you, like little yous. These are older, these are darker, these things have been around a while. These are wolves. And sometimes, when you're sitting in your nice walled garden, the wolves are howling in the distance, you kind of pay attention. And sometimes, the wolves are right up against the wall, howling, and they're the only thing you can think about. And sometimes, the dark forest is pelting you with so many messages that there's no possible way that you can examine them all, that you can even look at them. And sometimes, it's just one message over and over and over and over again. Your brain, these wolves are effectively running a distributed denial of service attack on you. They're trying to hack your brain. They're overwhelming your resources. That's what's happened to us during this pandemic. That's what's been going on over the last couple of years. That's why you felt tired and anxious and depressed and sad. Because you're just overwhelmed with this howling, with this constant threat of being in danger, of things not being normal, of things that need addressed, novelty, all of these things forcing you to engage that conscious self, consciously. If you like psychology, or even if you don't, if you touch software at all, you should know who Donald Norman is. He is the single psychologist that like, everyone should know in software because he does a ton of stuff of UI and UX and why it works the way it does. But he wrote this book called Emotional Design. And in it, he talks about how your brain kind of has two running processes. One of them is this cognitive logical process. The other one is this, what he calls affective process. And in psychology terms, that basically means like emotional. The affective process and its job is to sort your experience in the world into good and bad. And so what you can do is run some experiments with this. I can actually turn around and put what's called a positive affect on you. I can tell you that you're awesome, that you're doing really good work, that you're, you know, gorgeous and glamorous and an absolute beast out in the world doing great things. And what happens is, if you believe me, you actually perform better on cognitive tests. You actually think better when you feel better. But the inverse is also true. If I tell you that you have a minute and 30 seconds left to buy these airline tickets and there's only three of this on the flight left and two of them are in people's carts and if you don't buy now, you're an absolute freaking moron, I am trying to make you dumber. That's what's literally going on in these cases of what they call dark UX. I'm literally trying to get you to think less well, to make dumber decisions so you buy my stupid airline tickets. Stress diminishes our ability to think and to control our attention. 
So what happens when all of our routines are disrupted, when we're trapped and cut off from all of the things that have helped us manage our stress, when the wolves are howling, when everything is just going bonkers, what, do we, what does our brain do? It screams at us constantly. It just sends all of these messages about everything is terrible and you need to be doing more and you need to be accomplishing more and how can you be doing this and just sitting around. But all you wanna do is just like, please just let me sleep. The wolves are overwhelming your cognitive ability with a negative affect. And when this happens to us, we start seeking comfort wherever we can get it, wherever we have gotten it in the past. We start looking for ways to control our environment, however small or insignificant, right? Like this is a big part of why toilet paper was such a thing. It's a global pandemic out. I can't protect anybody from a global pandemic, but I can buy freaking toilet paper. Like I will have the toilet paper and we'll be done with toilet paper for a couple months. Check. Like it's literally a thing that helps you feel in control. We started finding new rituals, not always the most healthy ones. Not that hand sanitizer is bad, but I myself took it to excess at a certain point, right? And initially, our sympathetic nervous system, what they call that fight, flight, or freeze response, kept us rolling through the initial parts of the pandemic. That energy kept us going. But after a while, we almost kind of got used to it. You know, we acclimated to the situation. There was still this constant drip of cortisol, of stress, but we're like, okay, I can get through it. And then individually, each one of us hit the pandemic wall. The point when all of our systems finally went, you dumb, please stop. We're not designed to run at 100% for months and months and months and months. You're not designed to run the cognitive process that often. Your autonomous process is there for a reason. It helps you navigate the world because mostly the world is always the same, largely. And when it does change, it often changes very slowly. And so you started seeing burnout because burnout is a stress management problem. I have a whole talk on burnout if you want to like look on YouTube, but burnout is a stress management problem. And when you remove all of the ways in which we coped with stress and added a whole bunch more stress, yeah, we saw a whole bunch of burnout. We started to encounter this lack of forward progress this inability to make ourselves, quote unquote, do the things we needed to do. We started seeing emotional problems. We started seeing physical health problems. We started seeing diagnosable mental health problems arise out of the amount of stress coming from this pandemic. So things have tapered down a little, right? Fingers crossed. But what happens when the panic hits again? What happens when the next thing comes? How are you going to address it? Well, let's talk about some ways that when the next thing comes and the next fire happens, you can survive in that moment. The first thing you can do is just acknowledge that your capacity has actually diminished. Now it is in some ways actually physically painful to admit I cannot do all of the things that I used to do. But it is way better than continuing to try to do all those things and failing at all of them. If you acknowledge that I am under stress, I am under attack to an extent, and I have to scale back my efforts, you will be able to accomplish at least some of the things instead of failing at everything. Citation, my life during the pandemic. You can try cutting back your news consumption when things get really rough. Figure out some way, whether it's digests, whether it's you know, router blocks, whatever you have to do to try to scale this back. You can try reconnecting with nature. As the kids say, go touch grass, right? Find something that helps get you out of there, out of the environment where you are being constantly bombarded with stimulus, back into something that, to be fair, is a little more like what your brain evolved to handle. That will make you feel better. You can try seeking control in limited, reasonable ways, even if it's not useful. Okay, the toilet paper is not going to help you. Go buy an extra roll. It'll make you feel better. Don't buy a pallet of it. You know, an extra pack is not going to hurt you. You can also try, this is my favorite trick, find one thing in your situation or your living space that is bugging you, one thing, and improve it. How many people started home improvement projects during the pandemic? Yeah. It's kind of a natural thing, but it's a thing that can help a ton. 
Because again, it helps you feel like you're in control of your environment. It helps you look at something and say, I made something better. And your brain loves that. So how do we bounce back from this? Can we even do it? Can we even come back to the full strength that we were at prior to the pandemic? Well, luckily, we absolutely can. You can recover. And I believe that in each one of you. But you've probably heard the saying, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. You've probably heard that saying a lot. It's wrong, <laughs> spoilers. Certainly when it comes to your brain, it is not necessarily true. You are not going to automatically come out a stronger person from the other side of this experience. You don't just get it for free. There's a bunch of, I could spend probably an hour just talking about the research on this that I went down a rabbit hole on about actual change as a result of traumatic experiences. But the downside is when you have a traumatic experience, most of us will feel like we have changed. We will perceive change, but we haven't. And that actually makes us more likely to encounter stress and anxiety going forward in the world. So if you start from the assumption that this has damaged me to an extent, I don't necessarily become stronger. I have to work to get stronger. You will have a better outcome. And we'll talk about some ways you can do that in a minute. But first, let's talk about some strategies for recovery, how you bounce back. Recovering from burnout can take a while. And again, I got a whole talk on this, which is, I love, but it's, I mean, it has a lot of similarities to this too, shock. But one of the ways you can do that is find an activity that, where you can make a difference. Find something where you can help and change the world, again, in that small way. Exercise that tiny bit of control. Go find some things you can volunteer. Don't go too deep into it. Don't be like, okay, I'm gonna go be the CEO of this nonprofit. No, go find like Habitat for Humanity where you can go swing a hammer for a while and help out. You can also try and establish real work-life boundaries. I know that's super hard, especially for folks who are here, because you care enough to actually come to a conference about coding, which is your job. But it's also, for a lot of us, our hobby and our passion. You have to find a distinction, a delineation between what is work, what is your job, and who you are as a person. And finding those things will help you fight burnout because it helps you keep those walls more firm. <sighs> Recovering emotionally. Well, you can reconnect with family and friends. Actually go out and find new friends and reconnect with them. Pick up the things you've lost over the pandemic. Reestablish emotional connections. If you didn't have any beforehand, go make some. You're literally at a place that's great to do it. Make some connections. You could also try therapy. Before you roll your eyes, therapy doesn't have to be this big freaking deal, okay? It can just be for people who are dealing with something larger than themselves, like a global pandemic. There's a particular form of therapy that I actually quite enjoy called cognitive behavioral therapy. It talks about how your brain tends to think. These patterns of what they call logical fallacies or cognitive biases that your brain actually falls into these traps, like black and white thinking, that things are all one thing or things are all the other. It's all good or it's all bad. And it helps kind of train your brain out of some of those things through practice. It helps to in effect train your autonomous system. But as far as emotional recovery goes, some of it's just gonna take time. It's just gonna take time to come back and to recover yourself from these things. When it comes to physical ailments, I'm not super gonna be great about helping you with that. Like, I'm not a doctor. I'm clearly not the super most fit person in the world, but I will give you permission to go talk to your doctor. If you have started during the pandemic experiencing some physical symptoms and you're just like, oh, this is weird, but eh, I don't know if I wanna go to the doctor, go to the freaking doctor, okay? At least get it checked out. You've been under an immense amount of stress and cortisol dampens your actual healing systems in your body. Cortisol being the stress hormone in your brain. I also give you permission in general to just take as much time as you need to recover from this, okay? It is gonna take time. Don't just force yourself back into things. Breathe with it, take the time to grow and heal again. And find your path going forward, okay? We're in this moment, this pandemic moment, where we were separated from a bunch of the things that we had as habits, as patterns, as routines. This is one thing that the pandemic did actually give us. I want you to choose which of those things you want to do going forward. 
It forced us into this wider perspective. And I want you to use that perspective. These moments are fantastic for taking stock of where you are, of what you have to be, who you want to be. There was a study done in 2015 of a um, London subway system, the tube strike, a driver strike that happened in 2014. And being psychologists, they were like, ooh, it's a natural experiment. So they basically uh, interviewed people and they were like, did you use the tube beforehand? They found a bunch of people who typically commuted to work on the tube. And then they asked them afterward, after the strike, okay, did you, what, you know, did you go bike, did you walk, et cetera? And then when the strike stopped and the tube functions resumed, they asked, okay, did you go back to riding the tube? Only 60% of the people went back to riding the subway. 40% of the people liked the new route better. We are not always going to make the best choice the first time. I know that's like a huge spoiler, right? Humans are bad at choices, Who's, who knew? So you can use these moments when you are forced to not do a thing to say, is this actually worthwhile? Is this meaningful? Before you resume it out of habit. Similarly, we were isolated from our relationships. Choose which of those relationships, decide if they were healthy, or maybe if you need to establish some boundaries for that particular relationship. So we talked about surviving and recovering. At some point, the next thing is gonna happen. Whether it's monkeypox or aliens, I don't know at this point, it could be anything. So how do you handle it when that happens? Let's talk about things you can do to survive the eventual fire, the one you can see coming or that you know is coming. And the first thing is external systems. Find external systems or patterns of behavior that you can set up now that do become habits, that you can maintain even when things go to hell. External systems help you free up that working memory. If you build them as habits, they actually can become something long-term. Like if you know, you know, ride a bike or you do anything physical like play guitar, anything with muscles, over time, those movements become what we call muscle memory, right? You no longer consciously have to think about them. They become, they fold back into the basal ganglia, which is back above your cerebellum. It's all really fascinating, I'm sure. But point is, you no longer really have to think about it. You're just like, oh, this is a C chord. I don't play guitar, this is not a C chord. I think I'm using the wrong hand anyway. <laughs> and if you can figure out now how to make these things muscle memory for you, then when things go to hell, you are much less likely to drop them. Ken mentioned that I meditate. I find this a useful tool to help me manage stress. And it's a thing that anybody can do. You need no equipment. You need you and your breath. That's basically it. And it's really hard to screw up too. Like there's no, oh, I have to empty my mind. Dang, I had a thought, that's bad. No, the only way to screw up meditation is to worry too hard that you're going to screw up meditation really. But you can also try other things like exercising. Now I'm not saying you have to start necessarily, but you can go ahead and say, okay, well I do try to run. So I'm gonna buy myself some nice running shoes or a treadmill. I'm gonna buy a weight set now before the next thing happens. I'm gonna start using those things now so that I have that habit and I have those things and I can do these things in my house. You can work to build support networks. People can help you when things start going south. And that works great when it's personal. You have to know that when it is something global and it's affecting everybody, your support network is gonna look a little more like this. But they'll still be there to help you and at least you can commiserate together. You can ask yourself things like, what can you solve beforehand so you don't need to think about it in that moment? Most of us live here in Nebraska, so we don't have a ton of, at least in the eastern part of the state, we don't have a ton of problems with, say, wildfires. But you can ask yourself, what do I actually need in an emergency? What do I pack for a bug out bag if I need that thing? I mean, we have tornadoes here, but if we had flooding or hurricanes, it might make a lot more sense to have something where it's like, okay, this bag is already packed with some clothes that I don't care too much about. I'm just grab the thing and go. <coughs> Wildfires, earthquakes, all of those things. But here in Nebraska, it's like, okay, make sure you have some water. After the pandemic started, we actually started cycling in um, just drinking water that we feed our, you know, use to water our plants so we don't, it doesn't become stale or plasticky, but we just kind of rotate it. So we have like three or four gallons of drinking water handing around just in case. And we're trying to build that habit so that it's there when we need it. 
You can also work with your family to do things like build an evacuation plan. If you get separated, where are you gonna meet up? Thinking about those things, practicing those things, especially with children, is super important. Again, you're trying to work these things to become muscle memory so that when things go south, you don't have to think about this too hard. You want the autonomous system to handle it, not your conscious system. If you've taken a flight in the last forever, you've probably seen this. This is from the seat back safety card. It's part when they tell you like, if you have, you know, the, if the cabin pressure drops, oxygen mask will fall from the ceiling. Plaza the mask in front of your face, the strap of the back, yeah. There's a section where they start talking about, if you're traveling with a child or someone else who needs assistance, put your own oxygen mask on first and then help them. The reason they tell you this is because if you don't, you will put the mask on your child and then you will die because you don't have the oxygen. In a pandemic, in a stressful situation, you need to take care of yourself first so you make sure you can maintain. That doesn't mean ignore everything else, but it means make sure you are maintaining your own habits, taking the time for those things. Because if you don't, you will start to fail others that you care about, that you want to be there for. You need to do these things so that you can help others. Put your own oxygen mask on first. Because when the poop hits the fan, it's often those coping mechanisms, those external systems, if they're not trained enough, if they're not have it enough, that your brain goes, oh, I don't wanna have to think about that. We're just not gonna do it. And now you don't get the benefit of it. So we talked about how to bounce back from some of this stuff. And we talked about connecting with community and you're luckily at a place you can do a bunch of these things. David talked about community earlier, uh, yesterday. And I want you to go out there and I want you to connect with folks. I want you to learn new things. I want you to play. I want you to find what it was you loved about programming or find something in programming to love all over again. If you don't have a community, I want you to build one here. Start now. If you have a community, I want you to reconnect with it here today. And I want you to grow, to start that path toward recovery, to shake the dust of the last a couple years off and start forging your own path ahead to start building your tools, your toolkit, your systems of support to help you survive the next time that you are under attack and the dark forest starts howling. I want to thank you very much for listening. If you have questions, you can catch me at the Abitur booth. I have another talk later today at like 110. You can catch me after that too. Thanks very much for listening.